Yeah. 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 Y
Mark is presenting to you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. uh, uh, cut and paste. Uh, <laughs> I, <don't, laughs> I will fix the slides in time. But yeah, Mark will present. So if there are no comments on the on the agenda part, I will go quickly to the charter part. As I said, we had quite some discussion on the mailing list. This was extremely good. So the first part of the, the charter is the, the one that you see here on the slide is the in, introduction part. So it says what we space, but the important part is that what is involved and that says uh, that LISP working group is started to continue the work on obviously on LISP, including the extensions where when the working group has consensus on the fact that these uh, extensions are necessary, okay? And we are chartered to produce standard chart document. Does anybody has a comment on this? So I would say that the, the, the main context is clear enough. Then there are the, the work items that we listed, okay? We, we will not go through all of them. I mean, there are on, on the GitHub that Padma set up actually. And so just the title, we will continue moving uh, the uh, specification from experimental to standard chart when needed, if necessary, if we have sufficient deployment uh, experience. We have, for example, LCAF, multicast, uh, DDT is also uh, something to consider. And then there is a bunch of, uh, uh, of work that is quite mature, like the reliable transport that will be also be presented uh, today, YAM model, traffic engineering, NAT, privacy and security, external connectivity, mobility. And the last one is the least applicability work item, okay? Uh, ever since we, um, uh, the, the work, the, the, the focus of the of LISP has changed, so it's important to update all the documents that say where we can apply LISP. Okay, that's the purpose of the last item. And there was also some discussion on the mailing list about the milestones, the order of the milestones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have the latest list here uh, as for the last exchange that we had on the mailing list with Dino. Uh, we believe if uh, a reasonable list uh, can, be do, can be done in, in a safe pace. Obviously, uh, the important thing to keep in mind is if we are good enough to finish this documents, these milestones, before the date that is listed there, that's extremely good. And Jim will be happy. If we don't match this, these dates, uh, Jim will not be happy. <laughs> Neither the ISG. So, uh, and that's, uh, we have to, let's say, renegotiate a little bit and reshuffle the, the milestones. So just to say that if we are early, that's good, no consequences. If we are late, we have to discuss a little bit and really negotiate, okay? So any comments on this, uh, the, the list of milestones and the work items, anything? Dino, you did not queue up on the system, Oh, but we know you, okay. please continue. This, this is Dino, <laughs> I'm on the queue. Um, I would, only one comment. I would move geo coordinates up and put it with name encoding now because Elvaro already went through a process and that's almost like already there. And those two drafts are super simple. So I think if they could be processed by Jim and company together, I think we can get them out of the way. I think we are a bit late for November 2023, but we can certainly move it up to, to March. Yeah, but uh, we approved the charter, we go through a review, we, we issue the, uh, the call. I mean, uh, if we, 
So these 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 are suggestions. I mean, again, if we are earlier, we are happy. But we can move it up uh, at least to, to March 2024. So with respect to geo coordinates, Elvaro was going to move it, said it would be ready for ISG. There was one comment. And I reflected the comment like three IETFs ago, and then it just went into a black hole. So it should have been submitted last year. So I don't, so I don't know if we have a continuity problem or why it just fell off. Alvaro says it's, here's this one comment that should be put in the security section. I did that. I asked him if it was okay. He didn't respond. And then it just dropped off the face of the earth. Okay, but let's move it up to March. And, okay. and uh, let, let us review the document. And uh, if you feel you, or we agree it's uh, ready, we, we, we do the call on the menu. Okay. Padma, you want to add something? Yeah, I was just wondering, um, you know, for this document, um, maybe we should just take a last pass at it, you know, and, and see whether there's anything going on. One of the things that I would like to discuss a little bit later when we look at the charter is there are some new doc, new work coming in, and I want to make sure that things like transport becoming reliable transport, how much that impacts all these other features. So I'd like to take into consideration those things before we move out other things, just to make sure that we just don't push out a document and then we end up realizing that the change in transport has an impact. So that is something I'm going to ask everybody for all the documents that we're submitting from now on is to make sure that to look at the broader impact of those base changes. There is another thing we discussed in the routing area, the fact that uh, some, sometimes documents get stuck in the reviews that have we need once we pass the last call. So in the various area, we need a general review. So the idea is to try to to ask uh, uh, about early reviews uh, as much as possible, so that be sure that the document doc doesn't get stuck at some point after the last call. So we will try also to do this in a proactive way, so that, that everything goes smooth. Okay. I'm not, I'm not going to go to the mic, but um, as far as I'm concerned, even though I mean, I, our process of documents is not so much so. The majority of what we have spoken today has been about documents. But one thing you've got to mention as well is there, there were two RMCs that were not in the office that I came up with for that in the um, technical. Yeah, the. Um, just, just to know what you're saying. Okay, yeah, so I, uh, there were the. The ID, EID allocation block yeah, yeah. and the um, allocation guidelines. I don't remember the, 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 the numbers, but the, these two documents have moved to uh, historic. If you remember, this was an experiment to allocate a specific prefix for EID, which we did. It's no really used, so we, the, the prefix went back to Ayana. And uh, yes, uh, in the process, we lost track of this, but the, the, the idea from the beginning is, is was to move these documents as historic since they are not used. And rightfully, Jim did all, all was needed to, to move them. Good. Thank you, Jim. OK, so uh, uh, except for the geo coordinates that we will update, I mean, I, we seem that there is a, a, a good agreement on, on this charter, and uh, after this meeting, we will hand it over to, to Jim so that he can uh, further process it with the ISG and approve it. Okay? So, we can move to the first uh, presentation, which is a reliable transport. So I'm sharing the slides. Okay. Um, Hi, folks. Can you? Yeah. Yeah, we hear you. Yeah. Okay. Say yeah. slide and I will move it forward, okay? Sure. Okay. Hi, folks. I am Balaji from Cisco. Uh, I will 
uh, provide update on map server reliable transport uh, can you please move to next slide please okay quick recap on reliable registration so as we all know it helps to avoid periodic udp communication between uh, map server and xtr and we have been using map server reliable transport in production in multiple deployments for many years it does help in scenarios uh, where there are large number of eads let's say thousands of uh, eads and uh, lots of xtrs too in the order of thousands of xtrs so and also it does help uh, to do mass mobility at scale so it does help in very uh, big scale environment can you please move to next slide so this is just a update compared to last time it was presented so the main change was that removed quick and http as transport and focus only on tcp as the only reliable transport uh, this was done based on feedback and also there are no uh, known implementations of quick or http and we do have uh, this tcp implementation in production in multiple deployments so also if there is uh, interest yeah it can be considered as a separate draft in the future uh, like list for quick transport next slide please so the port 4342 uh, is what is intended so uh, we request ina to consider during approval time yeah next slide please so i think the implementation is stable and it's running in production for many years uh, we request for per group last call and also we would like to request can we move this to standard rock uh, because we do have multiple years of uh, deployment and also ica also is requesting for the standard track Okay, thank you. Be before answering this question, if there is anybody sure. that has a comment on this? Okay. As for the first question about the, requesting the, the working groups uh, last call, um, we started to, we the chairs, started to review a little bit the documents included in this one. Okay. We feel okay. there are a few um, missing part or inconsistency that we, we would like to fix before actually go for last call. And uh, so we will send to you uh, a full review in the coming uh, week, one or two, okay? okay? And uh, to, to, to clearly uh, point out what we feel is missing, okay? Uh, and what should be clarified, okay? okay. And then we, we can go forward with the last call. As for the second part, um, if you want to move it to standard track and there is experience running, we should add some text in the, in the document that, that, that clearly say this has been deployed, has been used there, so and so. Some, some, this is no, in, not a huge text to be added, but there must be some information why we are moving this from uh, experimental to, to standard track. Okay. Okay. So I think let, let's put it in, uh, in state uh, revision needed. We will send the, the review and then uh, we will work together to move it forward quickly. So, thank you, Luigi. Thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So next one is uh, e mobility. In principle, you can control the slides yourself. Please try. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, Mark at Cisco. Um, we are providing an update on the EID mobility draft. Um, Um, since this was last presented, I think in IDF 112, uh, just want to recap a little bit what the document is about. Um, the draft basically specifies a common control plane to, to concurrently support the layer three overlays with, and L2 overlays with EID mobility. 
with respect to L3 overlays, it mostly focuses on, on mobility since uh, the rest that is needed is specified elsewhere. Um, with respect to L2, it goes a little bit more in depth with unicast and multicast traffic specification on IP and IP in the subnet, and also how to do ARP and ND resolution using Lisp assistance. And then what is new in this version, in the latest version that we have uploaded, is, is the multi-homing support. Uh, for the rest of the presentation, I'll, I'll focus on multi-homing support. Um, the rest we've presented sometimes. Um, OK. With multi-homing support, uh, the, the idea is that um, the least parsey specification uh, talks about how to do multi-homing, and, uh, and uh, especially RFCs 9300 and 9301. But for L2 multi-homing, we, we need some additional mechanisms that are introduced in this, in this document. Okay. Um, the first thing that we need when we do L2 multi-homing is, and we discussed this multiple times uh, in the past, is we need an identifier so that XTRs can understand that they are multi-homing, they are part of the multi-home group that, that is providing multi-home access to, to a site. And after discussions, uh, what we did is we settled with site ID. Uh, we discussed these previous meetings and also in the in the list. And what I'm copying here is the text that we added to, to specify that what we agreed on. Okay. Um, also relevant, uh, once we are doing L2 multi-homing and since we are settling on this identifier, every registration, EID registration that comes from multi-home side must be registered with a side ID. Okay. Uh, so this means that we should always set the ID in the registration packet and, and send the site ID. Um, at the end, I'll provide an example of when this is relevant. Uh, OK, there are multiple aspects, but there is one that is particularly rele relevant. OK, then the first mechanism that is special of L2 multi-homing is peer XTR discovery. When we are doing L2 multi-homing into, into an L2 site, um, something that we want is that all the XTRs discover each other. <clears throat> this is relevant to do something like broadcast forwarder or, or the split horizon fil filter. Okay. Um, to this end, what we have done is we have defined a special ID that will be used for this purpose. The special ID is a distinguished name uh, that has a string like what it's Divide here, where we say L2 XTRs, and, and we use the, or we paste the, the site ID of, of the site that is being multi home. <clears throat> uh, in order to avoid collisions, what you are going to do is, is use a reserved instance ID where this is going to be registered into. And two particular things about this registration they must be always uh, done with the merge request bit set, okay? Um, this is so that the mapping system merge, merges all the R logs from all the XTRs that are registering, and it should al also always set the one map notify. Right? This is so that every XTR is notified about others uh, being part of this multi-home group. With respect to a mapping system, what we need is that the mapping system stores the aggregated list of R logs that are registering this, this special ID and that it sends a MAM notify to every XTR every time it's updated. <clears throat> okay. uh, another special thing that we need for L2 multi-homing is to select the designated forwarder. This will be the guy that is responsible to send broadcast traffic to and from remote sites. To this end, what we are doing is leveraging the multicast priority field in the R log records. Uh, what we are going to do is that um, each XTR can set a particular priority, putting itself in, ranking itself, let's say, in, in a list to be designated forwarder. And then the designated forwarder will be the one with the best uh, multicast priority uh, across all of them. If we have a collision, let's say multiple have the same M priority, the R log others will be the tiebreaker. Okay. Um, just as an example, right, if we have these two XTRs, um, 
A1 and A2 both register. One with A1 is registering with better multicast priority. It's going to be the one selected. Next one is the split horizon. Um, the, what the draft says is that all XTRs must implement proper split horizon mechanisms to, to avoid, especially uh, to protect against loops and also avoid some duplication in broadcast traffic. Um, in order to do this, what the XTRs can do is, since they are receiving the list of all R logs of all XTRs that are multi-homing access to this L2 site, they, they can use this list to, to install proper filters in, in, in the router, okay? One thing that the draft says is we recommend that only um, one of the XTR, uh, the designated forward joins the L2 replication list. This simplifies, if you want, the split horizon requirement. Um, we still declare it as a must, but but yeah, okay. If if someone follows this uh, follows this recommendation, it's not. Yeah, we may not be so dependent on it. Okay, and this is the example I was talking about before. Um, one of the reasons, for example, we want to make sure that all the IDs are registered with the same site ID is, for example, right, when we want to distinguish between registrations that belong to a multi-homing uh, case and mobility case. Um, let's say that you have a host that it's moving from a site that it's multi-homed, right, and to a site that it's not multi-home or some other multi-home site. Um, can, how can we make sure the mapping system and all the XTRs understand when the registration uh, needs to be aggregated and it's part of a multi-home site or, or it's actually a wrong the way situation? And this is where we use the site ID. Uh, for example, in the mapping system, what we would establish is that when registrations come with merge request bits and same site ID, the, the registration will be merged and all R logs uh, are understood as belonging to a multi-home site. When the registration comes with a different site ID, then the locator set must be replaced and, and we understand that it's a mobility case. <clears throat> XTRs would do the same uh, based on the R log list that they have received. They, they are able to distinguish between round away events and, and, and multi-home registration events. And that was the last one. Um, just as, as a note, I just uploaded the latest version for all of you, uh, if, if you can review. And also, as a side note, this specification has been in production for, for some years. I think you guys mentioned you have some comments, but um, yeah, we were expecting sometime soon to ask for last call for it. This one is early in the milestones. I learned more. Yeah, <laughs> I no, I think you put it very low. Very low? Yeah, but it's okay. I mean, we can work on it. But, uh, okay, yeah. okay, but we will, um, we will take it uh, uh, after this meeting and see how, how fast we should go. Okay. As I said before, if we finish before With the, the comments, yeah, we can always so reorder. Yeah. <laughs> Dino was in the queue. So a couple questions. Uh, when you said multi-homing in the split horizon check, you said for broadcast, you also mean unknown unicast as well. Yeah, that's Is that in the spec? Wherever you say broadcast in the spec, do you also say I should, unknown? Yeah, I okay. think I should extend, yeah. I'm okay. just assuming, but yeah. It's, it's a okay. Good, good and uh, you refer to split horizon, but you don't actually say how it works. No. Because now I'm wondering how it works. Oh. Because okay. there's one forwarder that then sends it to all other sites that are part of the same VLAN, mm -hmm. but it also come back to the XTRs for that site where the source is, right? Yes. So first question is, we are going to load up uh, the underlay with packets that are gonna come back to the site that are gonna be dropped by yeah. the ETRs at that site. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, and, and can, that's... but can the ITR know that it shouldn't replicate to the other R logs because it knows it's part of its site from the discovery mechanism? So okay. they don't even leave the site; they, they'll never come back. Is the question? Yeah, it's probably more efficient to do it that way. Yeah, right. When we are doing unicast replication, we could do something like this, right? If the underlay is multicast, then 
what we can do is what we recommend, right? Just if join the, the group. If the under if the underlays multicast, the other XTRs shouldn't join the group. Exactly. So they won't get it. We recommend it. Yeah, I don't know. There but, may be. But, uh, Oh, actually, song, yeah. if the underlay does multicast, you're going to have it's going to be more inefficient. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, because is the underlay multicast group mapping to all broadcast or all unknown? Because yeah, that, that's the problem, right? So um, yeah, normally you switch to multicast when I would say when you have a lot of XDRs. Uh, so I think we need to spec that carefully because okay. there's a lot of details there that aren't clear. But if okay. the underlay is, if we're replicating unicast on the underlay, the ITR could have, what it gets back from the mapping system could be all the R logs to all the other sites for the VLAN, except for the other yeah, R logs yeah. in the same site. That would be yeah, really good. Since we have the local list. Yeah, we have actually, the local yeah, list. You can true. filter so that out always... before you put it in the map cache. Yeah, that's good. But yeah, then when you map it to multicast, yeah, then it's gonna... okay because you're going to hit everybody else and these guys. So there's a source-based solution and a receiver-based okay, solution when the underlay is multicast. It's a good one. Yeah, I'll document that in the next version. Yeah, yeah, it's a good one. Okay. So I have a question. Um, yeah. Actually, when I was reading the doc, there's something that was interesting when you talk about the cache miss. Okay. So it really looks like this you know, change mm -hmm. is not without package loss, right? Have you yeah. ever considered how to prevent that package loss? Because I, I think there's a way, you know. Um, yeah, I, I would say this is somehow inherent to Lisp in general, right? Uh, right? So if we have a cache miss, um, we need to decide what to do with that target. Um, you know in, ahead of time. So you can fly the image. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So which is one thing which is interesting because when I was reading the graphs, okay. I, I noticed something. You had all those steps with the flows for L3. You will see that the first flow, you actually, the mapping system after receiving the new registration, at that point you should already know who's the next guy before you send it to next. So I would like to. You know, kind of basically go and relook at that piece, whether you can use that information and forward it directly so that the, you, never get you never get cash miss. So that was one of one. I've noticed a number of things like that. We can make it better, but I, I wanted to bring this one up. This is where L2 helps the situation yeah. versus L3, you can't do it. Yeah. Well, I, actually, it's something that we've implemented at Cisco, but again, not in any graph, is you, you have one default guy that you preload with everything, right? It's like a, if you want to combine map server and yeah. CXCR, um, that you can always forward to so that this guy, you, you, you don't have a, a, a packet miss, and, but you at the same time, you don't need to flood it to, to the entire network. So that but, comes to my second mm, comment, okay. is that I think there's plenty of things that are like, I would say hacks or ways things are, are deployed, which actually solve these problems, but they're not documented. So for yeah. somebody who's reading it, uh, you see the holes, mm -hmm. but you don't see what is the mitigation measures that are being taken. I think, okay. especially if this is going to stand the strap, you really have to write those, but you also need to have some analysis of some of these things that are downsides, uh, whether I would definitely encourage, I, I think there's ways of improving certain mechanisms that are in this draft. So okay. Okay. to actually go and look at that. Okay, yeah. Um, I'll send you my comments. Yeah, if you have a list, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, Thanks. Thanks for the comments. Okay. Yeah. Next. Yeah. Hi, Lisp Working Group. Uh, welcome to this talk on the P4 Lisp Browser. So, um, what is this talk about? Uh, I'll first give a very short introduction into P4, then we look at the P4 Lisp Router architecture, and finally I will uh, present some P4 Lisp evaluations. 
And by the way, uh, this work is joint work of uh, Benjamin Steinert, Marco Hevele, Jan Oliver Nick, Dino Farinacci, and myself. So um, P4, that stands for Program Protocol Independent Packet Processors, and it's, uh, it is meant for uh, uh, packet header processing, not for payload processing, but for packet header processing. And it's deployable on high performance hardware, like the in Intel Tofino ASIC, that is uh, capable of 100 gigabit per second, and Tofino 2, 400 gigabit per second. We have a short tutorial and uh, also survey on uh, P4 technology that has been uh, published early this year. Here's the reference on the bottom line. So how does P4 work? You write a P4 program for a specific P4 architecture model, and that is compiled to some uh, uh, switch target. Uh, so in our case, it's the uh, Tofino ASIC. At the same time, the P4 compiler gives you some output that is useful to, um, to program an SDN controller that uh, communicates with the switch over the P4 runtime, which uses the uh, GR, uh, GRPC calls to, um, to control the switch. Um, the, 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 the forwarding paradigm here is table-based. That means uh, packets are processed uh, using tables. You have um, some key that matches a certain packet, and uh, with this key, an action is associated and also action parameters, which are then applied to the packet. That is the basic principle of uh, P4. So uh, how does the P4 Lisp router architecture look like? Here, um, you have the gray box. Uh, the gray box is basically a white box switch. And on the bottom, we have the P4 data plane. Uh, here, the list packets are forwarded. The P4 controller runs on the same white box. So there's very little delay between the P4 data plane and the controller. And this controller controls the P4 data plane through this P4 runtime. Um, the P4 controller controls, um, communicates with the Lisp control plane, lispers.net, uh, via local sockets. And um, <clears throat> so how does this work in action? Um, on the left side on, on this slide, you see a host one that communicates over ITR1 and ETR2 with host two. So uh, a first packet, so when the first packet is sent, ITR1 does not have uh, uh, the mapping in its uh, table. So the, the uh, mapping will be retrieved from the mapping system and only then the packet can be forwarded to ETR2. What does that mean in the Lisp router architecture, uh, in this P4 Lisp router architecture? That is explained on the right side. So we see the host one issuing a packet that uh, arrives at the P4 Lisp router. Uh, it is received by the P4 data plane and no mapping is in the P4 forwarding table. So this entire packet is then forwarded to the P4 controller, which is on the same uh, white box switch uh, that extracts the destination EID and uh, forwards it over the local socket to the, uh, to, uh, to the Lisp control plane, lisp.net. That one retrieves the uh, required mapping from the global mapping, mapping system and uh, returns it to the P4 controller, which then installs the mapping in the, uh, in, the, in the forwarding table. And from then on, the Lisp packets can be forwarded. So that's the basic principle. Here is some sketch that it's not only a single forwarding match action tables that is uh, uh, employed in this uh, software. This, these are uh, six uh, forwarding tables just for the uh, XTR. And as we also implement RTR and PXTR, the entire um, uh, software implementation uh, looks rather like this one. So, um, what about evaluations? Um, we um, evaluated the, the data rate uh, for the P4 Lisp router. So 
uh, we ran an ITR, an RTR, an ETR on the P4 switch. And uh, then we uh, generated traffic up to 100 gigabit per second, and that was sustained. Uh, that rate could be sustained through this uh, chain of the three uh, different LISP routers. Uh, now, by the way, we can also use the P4TG, that's a P4-based traffic generator, which is able to do uh, 10 times 100 gigabit per second, which also runs on the P4 hardware. Um, so next, we also conducted functional unit tests. Uh, we have uh, tested different uh, deployments, namely XTRs, PXTRs, and RTRs. And uh, we also implemented some security features. For instance, when a mapping for a certain EID is requested, that should not be requested within the next uh, second, because otherwise we get too much load on, on the P4 controller. Um, then we restricted the uh, list packets to a certain range of source EIDs to avoid uh, misuse and uh, to limit the potential for, for DOS attacks. And in the same way, we also limited the, the range for uh, destination EIDs. Um, many other extensions are also supported by the implementation like NUT traversal, mobile load, and list NUT. And uh, when we need a double encapsulation, like for a mobile node, this is done in a single packet cycle. So this runs at line rate. And also uh, decapsulation and re-encapsulation, what we need for the RTR, this also runs at line rate. So this, uh, this is a functionality that is uh, supported within a single packet cycle. So now what about the controller performance? Um, to, to evaluate that, we sent 1,000 packets with different destination IP addresses where no mapping is available. So um, to test the controller performance, we sent those 1,000 packets at different, uh, uh, at different rates. So when we send them with 100 packets or 125 packets uh, per second, we saw no increased latency uh, to, get the, to, to get the answer. But when we send 150 packets per second, then we saw that the latency rises, but we did not see any packet loss yet. So we can say the performance is somewhere between 100 and 100, uh, between 125 and 150 packets per second. Um, so it's different EIDs that can be retrieved uh, because only uh, a specific EID is uh, retrieved only um, once per second and all other requests would be dropped directly on the data plane. So here's the conclusion. Uh, P4LISP is a high performance LISP router implementation for data rates uh, around 100 gigabit per second. This is on the Tofino 1 and on the Tofino 2, this is uh, 400 gigabit per second. It's an open source implementation and it leverages the open source control plane LISPers.net. All LISP tunnel routers uh, are implemented in a single P4 program, so XTRs, PXTRs, and RTR. And the RTR can perform re-encapsulation at, at line rate, and double encapsulation is also done at line rate, for instance, for this mobile load. We implemented some security features against DOS attacks, and, and P4 Lisp supports multiple extensions like this mobile load, NAT traversal, interworking mechanisms like this NAT, multi-homing load balancing and traffic engineering. Thanks a lot for your, uh, for, for your attention. Thank you. Tina? Two quick questions. Um, did you test 400 gig or you didn't get the opportunity? No. Okay. And for then- that we need a, the other hardware. You need hardware, yeah, okay. We don't have that. And if you got it, would you test it? Sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then the next question is another funding source, maybe. Uh, would you consider doing this for multicast? Uh, well, 
we do mildly cast on Tofino, but we haven't done this for, for Lisp. Uh, we did that for beer, oh, yeah. for various uh, flavors of beer. Um, Mark Cisco. Um, I think I saw, um, I think on one slide you were saying that you limit the fund rate to one packet per second. Yeah. And, and then you had that performance slide where you say you reach 150 packets per second. Yeah. Um, How are does these it... limits different places or? Uh, uh, um, yeah. So uh, we, when you have a specific EID, you can request the mapping for that specific EID only once per second. Okay. But uh, of course, you can request multiple different EIDs within a second uh, because you want to resolve oh, yeah. uh, many EIDs, uh, uh, and that needs to be done instantly. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, for a specific EID, only a single packet is forwarded to the control plane. Okay. Per so, second. So you filter. Per destination, you're able to rate limit on a per destination basis. Yeah, we, we filter it directly on the data plane uh -huh. to protect the control plane. Okay. Uh, because okay. as you saw, uh, the control plane supports uh, 125 packets per second, just different requests. Mm -hmm. And when you uh, start a stream constant bit rate to a certain EID, uh, and you would forward all of them to the control plane, the control plane would be immediately uh, overloaded. Okay. And just, uh, hmm? and just bringing it home, any plans to implement the ID mobility support? I mean, the, this would entail the detection, right? Uh, not, not just resolving uh, remote addresses, but detecting what it's locally connected to you. Um, mm. I'm not sure what they're asking. No, um, yeah, the draft that I just presented, uh, yeah, the rest of the draft talks about um, detecting local hosts and, and when they move around, just converging ah, okay. the network for that. We, we uh, have looked into that. Yeah, okay, just, mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Thanks. I have one mm -hmm. quick curiosity, you, you showed only Examples with IPv4 is also IPv6 implemented. Did you try to have IPv4 AIDs, uh, IPv6 R logs, or something like that, or is just IPv4? I think we have implemented only IPv4. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just curious. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to present the Lisp group mapping draft. And um, my colleagues from Cisco are Prasad, Ashwin, and Stig's in the room. I think Prasad's online. Um, so just a, a brief refresh of Lisp multicast. Uh, what is it? It really comes in two forms. Uh, in the early days in 6831, we figured a way of mapping um, an overlay multicast to an underlay multicast. Um, and what we did is we just distinguished between uh, an EID that was a source and an RLOC that was a source, which is the encapsulator. What that draft defined was um, based on receiving PIM join messages or IGMP reports, how you would tell the ITR um, that this state exists. So it could then um, forward um, PIM join messages to the source in the source domain. Um, so what we introduced was this new overlay state. We, we used, it, in, in regular multicast, we call these S comma Gs for source trees or star comma G. But since we have two layers of forwarding here, we had to introduce the term EID comma G in 6831 back in the day. And of course the encapsulator was the RLOC comma G. But note the G was exactly the same in both. That's what this draft is going to address. And then in 8378, we said, well, if you don't have underlay multicast, can we still have overlay multicast? And we could do that by replicating to unicast our locs. And the way we did that in 8378 was using the mapping system. 6831 did not use the mapping system. It used PIM so the ETR could talk directly to the ITR out of band. So it wasn't, it, it was 
83 or 6831 was very dependent on PIM to help the signaling. And that's why we called 8378 signal free because it didn't do any protocol signaling and used the mapping system as a database. And in that draft, we also introduced an RLOC set that can contain both unicast RLOCs and multicast RLOCs. So you can then, you could replicate to places in the network, in the underlay network that had multicast enabled and other places that didn't, okay? So what this draft actually does is it's formalizing the terminology, this two, two tuple multicast state, which we called S comma G. And so the overlay state has S EID and G EID now, okay? And the reason is, is because now the overlay group could map to different underlay groups uh, in the underlay because it's being supported by a provider that wants to have some influence on what groups that are being used, okay? So what we call the SEID is the source that's sending the packets. And the GEID is the group address that the source is sending to and that receivers that are on the overlay would join. Okay. So the underlays know nothing about these EID addresses, just like it doesn't know it for them for unicast. And SEID and GID are registered. They can also be registered as prefixes, not as like slash 32s for IPv4. So you can actually aggregate the mapping system by having a collection of sources in a power of two prefix. And then they use a group range, which is in a power of two uh, group prefix as well. Okay. Now the RLOC notation we use is interesting because we called it SRLOC. And SRLOC is basically the encapsulating ITR source address, okay? And uh, I guess we just could have called that an RLOC, but we wanted to be able to distinguish that. So the destination though, um, is what's the RLOC set that's in the mapping system. So if a particular EID, SEID, GEID entry existed, it could map to a bunch of URLOCs and GRLOCs. URLOCs are just unicast addresses that you would unicast the multicast packet to. And GRLOCs is a group address that this GEID would map to, okay? So the second part of the draft actually says, how do we map from GEID to GRLOC, okay? So basically the SRLOC is the encapsulating list router. Uh, the URLOC is the outer header destination address in the outer header. And that's used that in the case when there's non-multicast underlay. And GRLOC is the outer destination header address when, that you use when you have a multicast underlay. And all those addresses appear in data packets. So those are only fully specified addresses, slash 32s or slash 128s. Okay, so how do we map from GEIDs to GRLOCs? We documented two approaches in the draft, one hash-based and one mapping system-based. Um, the, uh, the hash base one basically just takes the GEID as input into a SHA-256 um, function and produces the GRLOC. And that's assumed that you want control in the XTRs and the underlay provider doesn't care what the group address is because it's decided by the edges. So what the ETR does is it hashes, when it gets an IGMP report for a GEID, it hashes that and into the GRLOC, and then it joins it on the underlay, either with PIM or IGMP, your favorite multicast underlay um, protocol or mechanism. And all ETRs will use, use the same GRLOC because they're all using the same hash function. So you want um, all the GEIDs to be um, mapped to the right underlay address. So it's very simple to do. On the ITR side, the ITR just does a routing table lookup and it, the GRLOC is, is in there and it just uses that. So the ITR and the RTRs don't have to do the hash, but um, they could if they want to, or they could if they want to, to validate that the GEID is actually mapping to a GR look that's in the R look set, okay? The second mechanism is just use the mapping system and that gives more control to the multicast underlay provider. So what we decided to do very much like the L2 XTRs in the mobility is to use a, um, a registered distinguished name called something like group-224111. And what that means is for the GEID 224111, it maps to something that the provider wants it to map to, like 225111. 
So basically what you would do is this, the service provider with an SDN controller or out of band network management system could register these mappings and the XTRs and ETRs would just use them. So the ETR would register SEID 224.111 with a GLOC of 225.111 and he joins the underlay to 225.1111, okay? And the ITRs and ETRs can use either approach to do mapping system lookups um, for the R look set. And that's pretty much it. So I would say that um, um, this draft really complements those two drafts and the three of them together, the kind of the trilogy, it really completes um, all the combinations of multicast that we can do for, for overlays. The status of the document, we started it on GitHub back in December, 2020, and we didn't publish it until March of 2023. And we called that underlay multicast trees, but we realized there was more functionality and that's why we changed the name to list group mappings. And we published that initially in April, 2023 and did a timer update in uh, just October now. Questions? Uh, Mark Siska, uh, just a couple of questions. Um, the first one, let's say the document is adopted by the working group. Um, are you suggesting that we change these, the naming uh, everywhere we use SG groups to, to the new notation uh, to clarify? Or, uh, um, I mean, it's more, uh, yeah. You mean in the entire document center or just in 6831? Or, or, yeah, for example, new drafts.com, like... Oh, should we adopt a new naming convention for yes. future documents? Mm -hmm. I would say yes, because we need to distinguish between them yeah. to, because it was very much assumed in 6831 that G in the outer and G in the under were the same yeah. value. Oh, okay. Yeah, then. And so if we really want to use different... And, and then I, I remember doing this back in the day with multicast running... Um, IPv4 multicast over ATM and frame relay and SMDS, those, we always had this many to one mapping where do you have all, all these groups that you wanna to map to something on, on the underlay? So do you wanna have one to one, one to many, many to one? Now with this terminology in the mapping system, we can do all those things. And the provider, you know, the provider will say, you have 10 groups and they're all going to the same sites. Why do I have to have 10 pieces of state in the underlay? I only could have one, so. And maybe another one be between the two mappings that you propose, uh, does the document uh, prefer or recommend one of the two? Uh, I mean, yeah, normally when hashing, uh, I would say debugging is a little bit more complicated, right? Because you, you don't know when something is broken. Uh, um, you mean the, hashing is a, a good or well, um, if, if I had to choose, I would choose what? the mapping system base because ah. it's very explicit, right? It says yes. these maps right. to this, right? And, but just, just wondering if the document is, is suggesting one uh, or two. No, the document optional. didn't suggest it. It just said if you wanted edge-based versus provider-based, you use one versus the other. Okay. So, okay. But, but you have a good point because what if, um, what if one GID hashed and there's – it because it, 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 it takes a 256-bit hash and then takes the lower – 32 bits in IPv4 mm -hmm. case. So what if multiple them hash to the same value mm -hmm. and you didn't intend that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Then that's, that could be a bug, arguably. Okay. But, so um, maybe we will list in the document the pros and cons and, and create a slight preference towards the mapping system. Okay. And, and now, not just because it's a preference, but there could be a potential uh, collision situation that happens with the hash space where the collision would never happen. Well, the collision won't happen with the mapping system case, but a misconfiguration could cause it to collide. So choose your poison, I guess. Right. But those are good updates. We can fix the spec for those comments. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. I had a similar comment like uh, the first Mark did. Uh, um, because we, we, we are supposed to, to revise the multicast documents and move some, some of them as a standard chart. I mean, makes sense to have a unified terminology. And in this case, yeah, put it in, in the documents. Uh, we will figure out the details. But I mean, this, this kind of, of unified terminology will be helpful among 
Yeah. So spent, uh... what I would suggest is if we adopt this terminology from this document, go back to 6331 and use the same. Exactly. Yeah. In the new set of documents, and I, and I think so we, in, we will in, put the terminology yeah. somewhere. That's the point. Yeah, yeah. I was suggesting. But, and they're all three documents. Well, yeah. Um, we, we don't need to, to, to discuss the details yeah, now. Uh, how to do it. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but sounds good. Uh, I've got a question. Yeah. <laughs> so, I was going to get away yeah. without it. Yeah, my question. <laughs> you know. Yeah, so well, one thing that I, I, I've noticed is that, especially when we start having the grouping claims, and there is multiple cases actually listed. One of them that's not listed is that the bad actor actually uses a true timestamp. And how do we distinguish with that? And what could at least would be, because if it uses an invalid timestamp, it's easy to find it. But if it is not using an invalid timestamp, he's going to be actually constantly. Are you saying timestamp or hash? Yeah, uh, so I, I didn't actually, hear. Uh, I was reading here, you know, the timestamp to give it a priority and uh, timestamp to get the priority yeah, so basically that's what we were talking about is that a bad actor could send an invalid timestamp giving it a tie-breaking priority when the group address collision occurs are you talking about gap yeah oh yeah completely so different topic okay yeah yeah so reset major one thing reset. is that i really think that while you were talking about this we oh. also need to talk about what failures are happening and what how those failures are getting um so let me rephrase your question yeah. so it's comprehensible in my brain. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if GAP, GAP is going to allocate a address to the applications, mm -hmm. that's GEID. Mm -hmm. yeah. And does that have effect on this? this one. Yeah. Uh, well, it does because that's decentralized and you don't know what the group addresses are going to be until the applications start to name. So the, the mapping system based one can't a priority know what it is. Mm -hmm. So you could only use hashing. So that that's an advantage for hash base now. Yeah, so I'm sorry. Okay. I, I didn't give it. Okay, I didn't, I didn't link the two different yeah, working groups yeah, together. So, okay. Yeah. Um, so we need to discuss and think about what the implications of those are. Mm -hmm. Great question. Really good question. Yeah, sorry, I didn't give you the context. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> I don't, Stig, do you have any opinions on this? That's the multicast expert in the room. Uh, yeah, Stig here. Well, I had one thought, but I'm not sure if it's a good idea, but uh, <clears throat> you could potentially, I don't know, instead of putting the GEID in, in the mapping system, put like the application ID or something. Ah. So, uh, so the mapping system would control yeah, which, which underlay group you but use we get, for that application. But the, we get a data data packet but, with two IP addresses in it, source yeah, and destination. Yeah. So then we'd have to map that thing to something else true, that maps to that. True, true. Yeah, well, that doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, okay. no, it's we'll, an we'll interesting, brainstorm interesting about it. problem. Yeah, maybe, maybe, we should, maybe we should bring this up in the PIM working group when we talk about GAP. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay, better we take it offline on this because we are three minutes over time. So thank you everybody for participating. Thank for the presentation. Uh, we will we'll, we'll, you will see us in Brisbane. Uh, <laughs> no.